Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all for this week's uh, uh, CME presentation. I can see right now it's 6 or 5 p.m. I think uh, we'll proceed and start. Our presentation this week is by uh, Dr. Isaac Adembesa, who is a cardiac anesthesiolo anesthesiologist at the KU Teaching and Referral and Research Hospital. And he's going to give us a presentation on cardiac implantable electronic devices in patients going for non-cardiac surgery. So Dr. Dembesa, Karibu. Um, Kawaid, as usual, um, you, can, you can always, we'll have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, and you are free to leave a uh, any question in the chat box and we'll have the session at the end of the presentation. Welcome, Dr. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Teddy. Um, I, I trust you can hear me. Yes, loud and clear. Yes, yes. Um, so um, today we are going to talk about uh, cardiac implantable electronic devices um, in, in patients who are coming in for non-cardiac surgery. Um, I know in our practice at some point um, we've encountered a patient who has, uh, let's say, a pacemaker um, and is coming in uh, for let's say an appendicectomy or an orthopedic uh, surgery. And most of the time, or sometimes, you know, we, we, we really don't know what you're supposed to do exactly. I remember early on in my career, we used to be told just put a magnet and you're good to go. So, um, the screen is not moving. Sorry. Yeah, so um, my objectives for this talk will basically be to define what um, a, a cardiac implantable electrical device is, and then just look at, you know, the various devices that are out here in the market and some of the indications. Uh, just briefly talk about the physiology of pacing, and then finally talk talk about how do we manage these patients when they come in for non-cardiac surgery. So I'll start with a few clinical scenarios. Um, so um, you have, um, I don't know how I can remove, uh, there is something on my screen here. Um, yeah, there we go. So uh, you have a 64-year-old man um, who, presents with syncope, and after cardiac evaluation, um, is found to have a complete heart block. Uh, so what kind of a device do we expect this patient to have? Or a 36-year-old man, um, very fit, non-known comorbid, uh, was playing volleyball, but then suddenly collapses and is unconscious, but after resuscitation, um, on the ECG, he's found to have a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. So he's defibrillated thrice and it reverts to normal sinus rhythm. But after telling the ECG, the cardiologist, uh, you know, concludes the patient has what is called Brugada type 2 uh, picture on the ECG. Or a 48-year-old man um, with a history of a dilated cardiomyopathy uh, with a low EF of 25% and is on optimal and failure medications. Um, he had a, a VF arrest and was successfully resuscitated. Uh, but you note on the ECG that uh, he has a wide and QRS interval of 140 seconds. So if you look at these three um, uh, case scenarios, you know, th these are patients who need some kind of a cardiac device, uh, but they need them for totally different indications. And, and that is what we are trying to, um, to, to cover a bit through this uh, CME. So just for introduction, a cardiac implantable electronic device in general term is def defined as, you know, a device, a permanent device that is implanted for rhythm management. So either a patient has a complete heart block or you know, they, they, they are at risk of a VF or VT, and therefore they need some sort of an implantable defibrillator uh, just to manage those kinds of, of rhythms. 
So they are broadly uh, divided into three. Uh, the first group is what you call the permanent case makers, which you commonly know, you know, they usually put for patients either with a, 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 a type two, morbid two, heart block or a complete heart block, um, ICD or implantable cardiovascular defibrillators for patients who are at risk of ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. And then you have loop recorders. I'll not talk so much about loop recorders because loop recorders Basically, the small devices that are implanted under the skin over the heart, and they basically do a continuous ECG monitoring. You know, for those patients who have um, either syncopal attack that you know the cardiologist can't really explain the cause, or you know they're having these palpitations that they can't really explain. So they usually they're, they're basically like implantable ECG recorders. Okay. So we'll not go too much into them because they, they, they really have an effect on our practice as um, anesthesiologists. And then um, the other thing we need to know, um, when it comes to surgery, our main concern is electromagnetic interference from the electrocautery devices used by the surgeons during surgery, because this electromagnetic interference interferes with these devices. And therefore, you know, as anesthesiologists, we need to be uh, very aware of. So, you know, from monopolar diatomy to bipolar uh, to radio frequency abrasions, which, you know, are becoming very common, especially in Nairobi. You know, you see a lot of surgeons, especially vascular surgeons, doing, uh, you know, radio frequency abrasion for varicose veins. General surgeons are even doing it for hemorrhoids. And then for pain management, um, there's something called Pachytena's lesser disc decompression. So the, the, we, we, are, we are seeing a lot of use of lesser for pain management, you know, for those patients with chronic low back pains. And all this, uh, you know, generate a lot of electro uh, mag uh, magnetic interference to this kind of devices. Um, for ICD, uh, uh, so patients who have ICD devices, um, these are just implantable defibrillator. What electromagnetic interference can do is either, you know, it can induce inappropriate anti-tachycardia pacing or even defibrillate the patient. And, and, and we need to be aware of this. So I've um, talked about the indications of the various types of devices. Um, we all know. Um, common indicators for a permanent pacemaker is a patient who has a complete heart block or a second degree morbid two block or patients who have six uh, sinus syndrome. Uh, for ICDs, I've talked about you know patients who are at high risk of sudden death, either because of uh, a congenital heart issue that predisposes them to ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. And we see this in patients with like Brugada syndrome or long QTC syndrome. Um, we see this, especially among athletes. Uh, for those who like football, uh, Christian Eriksson, you remember from the last year when he actually had a cardiac arrest on the pitch and he has an ICD implanted, which he has up to today even as he plays. Um, ICDs are also implanted in, 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 in patients you know, who are end stage heart failure, who are waiting cardiac transplantation, because these patients are at a very high risk of ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. Then there's a, a third group of um, electronic devices. We call them cardiac synchronization uh, therapy devices, which can either be uh, cardiac synchronization therapy with a defibrillator or with a pacemaker. Uh, dependent and these de these devices are usually implanted in patients who have um, what we call uh, uh, compensated heart failure, systolic dysfunction with low EF of less than thirty five. So if you see on the ECG, you have a patient who is in heart failure, they have a low EF. The cardiologists have optimized the anti failure medication, but that EF is not coming up. And they have a wide QRS interval. They're always at high risk of getting particular tachycardia or particular fibrillation. So in this case, these patients don't get an ICD, but they get a CRTD. So it's 
what basically this device does is it synchronizes the contraction of the right and left ventricle, but at the same time, it has a defect. So if this patient gets a ventricular fibrillation or a ventricular tachycardia, then it's able to, to shock the patient. Uh, but you also have others which have pacing capabilities as well. So in case they get a, a complete heart block or a symptomatic bradycardia, then the device is able to uh, to pace. Now, studies have shown this cardiac resynchronization therapies actually improves uh, symptoms in patients, you know, who have, uh, you know, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and who've been optimized on uh, medical therapy. So in terms of physiology, um, basically a pacemaker or an ICD or a CRTD device, they have this device here which is called a generator. It's inserted just below the clavicle, commonly on the left side, which is the non, or the non-dominant hand. Um, and the reason why we commonly put on the left is because most patients are right-handed. Uh, so you don't want, uh, you know, because you use a lot your left, your, your right hand, you don't want the, the lead to be damaged because of, you know, constant use of the arm. So that's why it's, con it's commonly put on the left side. So you have the generator, or in layman's language, what is called a battery, but it's basically a generator. And then there is this lead, which in a pacing, uh, we call them a pacing lead. It's usually insulated. Um, so in a normal pacemaker, uh, which can either be, uh, we call it single chamber or dual chamber. Single chamber meaning you're only pacing one chamber and dual meaning you're pacing two chambers. So either the HM or the ventricle. Um, so you'll have, this one here, this, the end of this lead either implanted in the right ventricle or it's implanted in the right atrium. So basically what this generator does, it generates an electrical current which stimulates the heart muscle and, you know, and that is how pacing um, works up in simple terms. So in terms of epidemiology, how common are these devices out there? How common are pacemakers? Now we don't have local data, um, but you can see from the West, on average, they actually put about 532 devices per million people per year. So these are quite a lot of devices. Um, in, the, in our country, um, these devices were mainly put in the private hospitals, but now we are seeing more and more of these devices being put in public hospitals, um, like at Kenyatta National Hospital, uh, at KU, um, and then of course the main, and of course general, um, um, uh, MTRH, and as late as last week, Odaya, I think KNH Odaya, they put their first pacemaker last week, which is very commendable. But what this just tells us is expect uh, to meet uh, some of these patients coming in uh, for non-cardiac surgery, and therefore we need to be very familiar with this uh, devices and know how to, to manage these patients. We don't have local data, how many pacemakers or CRTD or CRTP are being inserted, but just roughly um, from KU in our cat lab, nowadays we put about between uh, uh, four to five uh, CRTD and ICD devices per month, uh, and uh, another about five to 10 pacemakers. So the, the numbers are still small, but it's also it's just because our, our, our cat lab is also still young, so it's, 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 it's barely a year old. Uh, but I know KNH, they, they put many, many more than, of course, uh, what is happening at KUTRH. Um, so you cannot talk about pacemakers uh, without talking about uh, pacing cords. And we also need to be familiar with this, uh, whether you're a cardiac anesthesiologist or general anesthesiologist. Uh, because these patients will come to you, and you you have you you have to you, you must have an idea um, what kind of pacing mode they are on. So worldwide, the the the, the, the code that has been adopted is one which was developed by the North American Pacing and Electrophysiology Group, together with the British Pacing and Electrophysiology Group. In short, it's usually called NBG uh, codes. And basically what they do is they have assigned five positions uh, to any basic de uh, device. But most uh, modes you'll just see 
uh, only the first three digits uh, being indicated and not the fourth and the fifth. And I'm going to explain that. So basically, um, the first position on the pacing code is the pacing chamber. So if let's say you see a patient comes to you and has a pacemaker, and you see on the label that's indicated the mode is VVI, you know. So the, 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 the first V is the first position. It just tells you which chamber is being paced. So in that case, the, in, in, a, in a patient with a VVI mode, it means the chamber being paced is the ventricle, and in this case, is the right ventricle, okay? If it's in, it starts with an A, then it's an, an HM, okay? Then second position is usually the chamber which is being sensed, okay? So in case of, let's say, VVI, the second V, again, will be the ventricle is being sensed. So it will be the ventricle being uh, paced, ventricle being sensed. So that is where the lead of the pacemaker senses the intrinsic electrical cardiac activity. So it's in the ventricle. That's where the sensing happens. If it's in the atrium, then it will be the atrium. If it's sensing both in the atrium and in the ventricle, like in patients who have dual chamber pacemakers, then you have the D in the, in the second position. And if both chambers are being paced, then you have D, meaning dual. So both atrium and ventricle are being paced. Then in the third position is the response of the pacemaker to the sensing. So if the pacemaker is sensing um, um, an, an electrical cardiac um, activity, what is the response to that sensing? So does it, pace or does it not pace? And that is where you have that I inhibit. So if it senses an electrical activity, does it sense, does it pace or does it not pace? Okay. So that's why you have A that does not pace, which is none or it inhibits. Okay. Then the fourth position. Now this one is for more advanced devices. Um, the ones which are able to automatically adjust the pace, the, 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 the pacing rate. Uh, depending on the patient activity. Let's say if the patient is exercising, so some of these devices are able to sense either an increase in the minute ventilation and they automatically rate modulate. So they increase the rate, okay? The rate of pacing. So let's say if it was pacing at 70, it can, it can increase to 90 or 100, depending on the, on the, on the, on the activity. And then position five, this, this only applies to ICD devices and CRTP or CRTD devices. So it's either shocks or passes or uh, uh, like, yeah. So this one, position five only ap applies to ICD and CRT, CRT de devices. So it doesn't apply to normal pacemakers. So, so these are some of the commonly used pacemaker modes. The first one is what you call the asynchronous mode. So you can have either AOO, VOO, or DOO. Remember, we said position one is the chamber which is being paced. So in this case, it's the atrium. And then the second position is the response, uh, the, the, the chamber which is being sensed, I mean. And then what is the response to the sensing? So in this case, you know, this is the atrium being paced, and there's no chamber, there's no, this is position two, sensing chamber and there is no response to it. So the asynchronous mode, basically, if I can compare it to mechanical ventilation, um, and you, you have this device, you set the rate of pacing at, let's say, 70 beats per minute. It will not care whether the patient has an intrinsic cardiac electrical activity or not. It will just pace at 70 beats per minute, OK? And you know you can have either so these modes are either where the lead is whether you are you're only passing the atrium you're passing the ventricle or you're passing both the atrium and ventricle that's where it's a o o b o o d o so it's equivalent uh, if you can look at it in terms of mechanical ventilation the controlled mandatory ventilation where you say I want to give a tidal volume of five hundred at the rate of twelve the machine will give a tidal volume of five hundred at the rate of twelve irrespective of whether the patient is making a breath or not. So this is the equivalent, that is what you call the asynchronous mode. And the reason why I bring this up, this is very important because this is what happens 
if you put a magnet over a pacemaker, it automatically reverts to the synchronous mode. So if the manufacturer set the synchronous mode at 60 beats per minute, it will only pace the patient at 60 beats per minute, irrespective of whether the patient was doing 100 or 90 or 50, okay? Now, the risk with that is a phenomenon called R on T, which can induce ventricular fibrillation. Because if you pace, um, um, when you know uh, the, the, the heart is in the repolarization phase, then theoretically you can induce ventricular fibrillation. That is the only problem with this asynchronous mode, okay? Then uh, single chamber demand pacing, uh, of course we, we use this a lot in open heart surgeries, like if a patient is coming off bypass and their rate is low and you want to, 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 to pace a bit until the heart recovers, then you can do this demand, demand pacing. Then as the heart picks up, um, it's more or less like if you compare to mechanical ventilation to winning what? So as the patient, the intrinsic electrical activity improves, then uh, you have less of uh, the patient. the pacing is suppressed, okay? Then of course, dual chamber sequential pacing. So you are pacing both the atrium and the ventricle. This is commonly what we do in patients with the complete heart Um Yeah, and then I had talked about red adaptive pacemakers. So this one's basically what they do is, depending on the patient activity, um, if the requirements, there's more demand of the heart, then the, 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 the pacemaker automatically adjusts its level to, 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 to meet the demands of the body. Yeah. So about ICDs, so ICDs are usually, they're basically implantable defibrillators. So what they do, their job is to, uh, detect if a patient is having a ventricular tachycardia or a ventricular fibrillation, they defibrillate. Now, modern ones, they, they even do synchronized cardioversion. So if a patient gets an SVT, they're also able to cardiovert the patient and they're they also able to pace the patient because some patients after defibrillation, they go into bradycardia and you have to pace the heart. So the same device is able to, is able to pace the patient. So that is that is for an ICD. Sorry. Uh, now for CRT devices, cardiac resynchronization, as I said, these are devices which are inserted in patients in heart failure. So patients with very low EF of less than 35 uh, percent. Uh, so the, the whole purpose is just to synchronize the contraction of the right and the left ventricle so that uh, you know, the, 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 the contractility of the heart is improved. Now, because some of these patients um, usually are at risk of getting either ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, especially if on the ECG, the QRS interval is prolonged, meaning more than 130 seconds, then in, in that case, uh, you put uh, a device which is called a cardiac synchronization therapy with defibrillator. But if a patient has a low EF and they have features of a heart block, then, and, and the QRS interval is not prolonged, meaning it's less than 130 seconds, then you put a cardiac synchronization therapy with a pacemaker. And that is what differentiates the two. So um, they, they, they've been, Talk about you know patients after myocardial infarction, some of them because of the scar tissue at a high risk of getting ventricular tachycardia and fibrillation. And in, in, in some centers, you know, they, they, they implant actually defibrillator ICD devices in these patients just as a primary uh, prophylaxis against uh, future ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. Yeah. So how do we how do we uh, prepare for these patients if they come for non-cardiac surgery. So as an anesthesiologist, you will be called to do your pre-op assessment. And the, there are four main things that you need to, to do in terms of evaluating this patient. So first of all is 
you want to know if this patient has a, a cardiac implantable electrical device. What device is it? And, and the fact that they have that device, it means they have a significant cardiac disease. So it's very important to take a full history, know why that device was put, what were the indications, and examine the patient. Uh, it's always good, you know, just, just check under the left clavicle. If you feel something there, then just know the patient. Our patients are very interesting. Uh, most of them, when they come to the hospital, they will just tell you, I have a pacemaker. So it is, it is up to you as the doctor to figure out what kind of pacemaker is. Um, and, and, that, and that is always a big challenge because ideally they're supposed to work to work with a label which tells which device it is, what's the company, and what mode are they on. Because there are different programmers for different for different devices. But from uh, my short experience, most of the patients will just tell you I have a pacemaker, and that's it. And if you ask them what it is, they have no idea. So identify the device, then determine whether this patient is dependent on this device. So if this patient has a pacemaker, are they pacemaker dependent? And it's very easy to determine. So one is you ask about symptoms. Do they still have syncopal attacks? Do they still have dizziness spells? And then do an ECG or connect them to an, uh, a cardiac monitor. If, if there is a pacing spike before every beat, then that is a patient who is pacemaker dependent. And that tells you that in the intra-op period, you have to take all precautions to make sure that whatever the surgeon is doing, they don't interfere with this device. And then finally, determine whether this device is actually working, if you have time in elective procedure. So send these patients to the cardiologist. Uh, they usually have these programmers. They're able to connect on the, on the, on the generator, and they'll be able to tell you uh, the kind of device and, 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 and whether it's functioning or not. So these are some of the recommendations from the Heart Rhythm Society. So device interrogation, this is usually done by the cardiologist. So if a patient had an ICD inserted, it has to be interrogated at least within six months to make sure that it's functioning optimally. For a conventional pacemaker within 12 months, for a CRT device within three to six months. Okay. So what do we need to know as an anesthesiologist? First of all, you need to know what kind of device uh, does this patient have? What brand is it? Is it Medtronic? Is it Biotronic? Is it Boston Scientific? Is it Cartman? There are so many of these devices out here in the market, um, and all of them have different programmers. So it's very important to, 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 to have an idea of what kind of a device the patient has, because your hospital might not have the programmer for that, especially if they are um, a bit more complicated devices like CRT and ICDs. And then what is the magnet mode? A magnet might work well for just a simple pacemaker. It might not work well for advanced devices like CRTD or CRTP devices, because what a magnet actually does for this uh, advanced devices is in, uh, or, or, or converting the pacing mode to asynchronous mode, they deactivate the defib part of, of the device. So that, what, what that means is during that intra-op period, you need to be aware that that defibrillator is not working and therefore you must have your external defib ready and if possible, have the, the, the pacing parts uh, fixed on the patient. And then of course, as, as I said, try and find out why does this patient have this pacemaker? Were they having syncopal attacks? Did they have a cardiac arrest? Uh, that's very, very, very important. And then what rhythm does the patient have when the pacemaker is actually shut off? So th these are some of the things that um, you, know, you can interrogate in the pre-op period before uh, planning for the, for the surgery. So when, when do we send this patient for reprogramming? So any rate modulated pacing device, ideally you need to send to the cardiologist uh, to reprogram it. 
Um, and then what was the indication for, you know, for, 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 for the device to be inserted? So patients with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy with very low EF or pediatric patients. These are patients who are at very, very high risk um, if you interfere with the device. And it's always important to refer these patients to the cardiologist so that the device is reprogrammed before, before surgery. Then after surgery, you send them back so that they set it back to the pre-op settings. And then what kind of surgery is the patient going to have? So if the rule usually is the closer the surgical incision is to the generator of the device, the higher the chance of interfering with the normal functioning of the device. So uh, normal rule, you use the umbilicus, so any surgery above the umbilicus, it's a high risk surgery um, and, and the rate of in interference of, electromag of electromagnetic interference to the device is very high or any surgery 15 centimeters from, from uh, the device. Like let's say a patient has a fracture humerus on the left side and the generator is just under the, 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 the clavicle. So that is very, very close to the device. So you need to be, you need to be very, very uh, aware of that. And then there are certain procedures that, you know, the surgeons are using very high energy, like a patient who has kidney stones and they're coming in for lesser lithotripsy, lithotripsy. The electromagnetic interference from lesser lithotripsy are very high. So the chance of interfering with the device are very high. And therefore, those are patients you want to send to the cardiologist for reprogramming before you plan them for surgery. Same with TRP or hysteroscopy or even uh, psychiatric patients who are coming for ECT. And then uh, MRIs were contraindicated in, in patients with pacemakers, but those were pacemakers which were manufactured before 2009. Most of the devices currently are actually MRI compatible. Okay. So in terms of investigations, always do a 12 lead ECG. One, to confirm if the device is pacing, if the patient has a pacemaker. Um, and then from the ECG, we'll also tell whether the patient is pacemaker dependent. And then a chest X-ray, I'm going to show some images here where a chest X-ray is very important because a chest X-ray can actually uh, tell you what kind of a device the patient has in case of an emergency, uh, let's say you know, it's a trauma case and you know the cardiologists are not there or there's no programmer and this patient has to be operated. A chest X-ray is very important. Then electrolytes, of course, electrolytes, as we know, uh, especially potassium, calcium, they interfere with normal electrical activity in the hand. Therefore, they interfere with, with pacing. So it's very important to, 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 to always do that. So this, this is an example of um, chest X-ray for various devices. So you can see our first device. So as I said, this is a generator. This is the passing lead. And you can see here, there are two, there are two passing leads. Now, what is very, very important to give you an idea what kind of a device it is, always look at the tip of the passing lead. So if you look at this, all the, the, the pass, the pacemakers, the leads, the tip of the leads are usually similar. You see, if you look at this tip, look at this tip, and look at this tip, you see, because this is this tip is what is implanted in the heart muscle, okay? So it's actually screwed into the heart muscle. So that's looks like. But if you look at the first image, there's something unique about this lead here. So after the tip, there is more or less like a coil. So if you see a device, this, you see two leads, and then just before the tip, there is a coil, and there are two leads, or one lead, but there's a coil. This is an ICD device. So this is an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. So treat this patient with the respect they need. Ideally, before surgery, a patient with an ICD, it has to be, the defib part has to be deactivated, if the surgeon is going to use electrocautery, whether it's monopolar or bipolar, because when an ICD, any interference with it, you know, it, it, 
with ECG, interference with the ECG, it can sense it as VF or VT and it shocks a patient. I remember one time um, early on when I was still working at Karen, there was this patient who was booked for uh, a surgical procedure under local anesthesia. And the surgeon was like, this is a small thing. I'll just infiltrate uh, lignocaine and then buzz a, a bit and the surgery is over. So the next thing, we just had the patient screaming in, in, in theater because this thing was just shocking continuously. Um, it was not a very good sign. So we had to completely sedate the patient and, and, and call off the thing. So the patient actually had an ICD, but the surgeon thought it was just a normal pacemaker and he had managed to convince the patient he'll just do the lipoma under local, yeah. So that is how these things can be important. Then. The second chest X-ray, again, you can see same thing. There's a, a generator here, two leads. This one here is in the right atrium. And this one is in the right ventricle. So this is actually a dual chamber pacemaker. You can see the difference between this lead and this one. This one has a coil, and that's why it's an ICD. This one doesn't have a coil here. It's just a simple lead with a tip. So this is a dual chamber pacemaker because you have two leads, one in the right atrium, one in the right ventricle. So this gives you an idea of what the, the device is. And therefore, if you have these two patients, for this one here, if you put a magnet on this generator, it will revert to a synchronous mode and nothing will happen. This one, you put a, a magnet here, in some patients, depending on the company of this device, it actually deactivates the, the, the diffuse part in some patients, depending on the manufacturer, but some manufacturers usually have deactivated uh, interference from even a magnet. So even if you put a magnet here, it will not have any effect on this, on this device. And that's why it's important to have an idea what it is. So ideally, uh, if these two patients were coming for an elective procedure, I would send this one to a cardiologist to have this defib deactivated before the elective surgery. And then intra-op, you would want to have pacing pads on your defib ready just in case you need to, to shock the patient. So more x-rays. Now there is another one here. So this is a generator and you can see there is one lead. Simply, there's only a tip, there's no coil. So this is a single chamber pacemaker and it's just pacing in the ventricle there, okay? Now look at the fourth image. Now this one, you from the genitor, you can see there are three wires, there are three leads. So there is one here in the atrium. There is one here going into the ventricle, but it has a coil. And there is one here going into the coronary sinus. So this is a CRTD device. The reason why it's a, a cardiac resynchronization therapy with the defibrillator is because you can see there is a, a coil here. This is a very good OSCE question for the registrars. So there is a coil um, and therefore this device is actually able to shock the patient, okay? So we need to be, to be aware of that. Now, if you get such a device, but now without this, without this coil, this is a CRTP device, okay? So it stops being a CRTD, but it's a CRTP. And that's what differentiates the CRTD and a CRTP device. So just from chest X-ray, you are able to, to have an idea what kind of a device the patient is, even if the patient had no, had no idea. So this is very important. Again, in terms of cost, uh, CRT devices are very expensive. Uh, even in a public hospital, we are talking of the cost in the range of 800,000 to 1 million shillings. A uh, single chamber pacemaker, somewhere in the range of 120 to 150,000. Dual chamber, about 250 to 300,000. So you can just see in terms of cost implication to the patients, you don't want to interfere with, this, with these devices. Okay, so I hope you are on the same page. Now, in terms of telling whether the patient is pacemaker dependent or whether the pacemaker is working. No, from a normal ECG, look for the pacing spikes. So just from the ECG again, you can tell 
if a patient has a single chamber pacemaker or a dual chamber pacemaker. So if there's a pacing spike before P wave, you know this device is pacing the atrium. So it's likely atrial pacing. There's no spike before QRS. So you can confidently say this patient has a single chamber pacemaker, which is pacing the atrium. Oh, okay. Then if you look, look at the second ECG, now you can see there is a pacing spike before every QRS. So, but there is no pacing spike before a P wave. So this is um, this is ventricular pacing. And if there is a pacing spike before every QRS throughout the the ECG in all the leads, this patient is pacemaker dependent. So again, you don't want to interfere with this during surgery because it means it means this patient is dependent on this pacemaker. If it stops working, you are likely to run into trouble in trouble. So intraop management, what do we do after you have an idea of what kind of a device the patient has? So um, for CRT, CRTB, uh, or CRTD devices, always have your external pacing ready. So temporal pacing, have your parts on, make sure your defib is working just in case you need to, you need to use them. Then uh, it's always good to inform the cardiologist or those cardiac technologists who operate these devices. Um, uh, just to have the programmer in case it, it was a major surgery and you, you are concerned that it might interfere with, with the device. Always do continuous ECG monitoring and, 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 and pulse monitoring, very important. Regional anesthesia wins every day for patients that you are concerned about their heart, always go for regional. Um, and then there are certain drugs you have to avoid in patients with pacemakers. So avoid any drug that blocks the senior atrial node or the AV node. And this includes a very good dexmedetomidine. Be very careful with it if you're doing TIVA in a patient with a pacemaker and maybe which has been deactivated. Uh, succinylcholine, it induces fasciculations and therefore not a good option for a patient who has an ICD or a CRTD device because they can easily confuse um, these devices. Um, yeah. And then if you need to put a CVC, where do you put your CVC in a patient with a pacemaker? Now, because we've said, the commonest vessel they cannulate is the left subclavian. Try and avoid necklines as much as possible uh, because uh, for two reasons. One, you can easily dislodge those pacing leads. And once they dislodge, they have to go back to cut light for reinsertion. And then of course, least, uh, risk of infection. So if you can avoid uh, neck CVCs, in the, these are the patients you might need to consider uh, femoral CBC. Now, the surgeons have to use diathermy. So bipolar is preferred over monopolar and let them use short baths and not those long baths. And then uh, always inform them to avoid diathermy directly over the generator because that can damage uh, the device. I've talked about magnet application. So when you put a magnet on a normal pacemaker, it it, it, it reverts it, uh, to the asynchronous mode. So meaning, uh, based on the manufacture of that, table, if they've set it to base at 60 when you when you put your magnet, be careful with the devices like ICD and CRTP with the magnet. Some magnets don't work on some CRTD or CRTP devices. Um, and that is just how uh, the manufacturers have made it. So you can see yeah, magnet response can be disabled in some devices like St. Jude's, Boston Scientific. And that's why it's very important you send these patients pre-op to the cardiologist for reprogramming and they can advise you whether you need to put a magnet in drop or not, okay. Yeah, so I've, I've already talked about that and then Patient position, very important, especially if you're going to, to put a magnet. You can imagine uh, putting a magnet um, over the generator in an obese patient 
that you're going to position in prone. It's likely to be displaced somewhere during the surgery. Um, and then the surgical site also. And then in some obese patients, even the magnet doesn't work because of you know, the fat um, layer you know, between the skin and the device. So they don't work. They don't work very well. So in such patients, always consider sending them to the cardiologist for the programming of the device uh, before before surgery. And then, of course, it can cause loss of resynchronization and in case of uh, CRT devices. So in summary, uh, this is uh, just a flow diagram, what you need to do. So first of all, uh, try and figure out what kind of a device the patient is and the indication for that device and whether the patient is dependent on that device. Then the next thing you want to ask yourself is, is electromagnetic interference likely during surgery? So if the answer is yes, then the next thing you want to ask yourself, is this patient dependent on this device? And is the surgical field away from the generator or less than 15 centimeter from the generator? If it is very close, then consider putting a magnet in emergency situations. Um, but if electromagnetic interference is unlikely, is likely or is unlikely, then consider sending these patients to the cardiologist for reprogramming. Same thing happens for ICD and CRTD devices. Thank you so much. That's the end of my presentation. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Adembesa. That was a very um, illuminating, very good presentation. We have some questions on the chat box. The first one is from uh, Dr. Guaro, and she commends you for the presentation. And her question is, how will you know the rhythm when the pacemaker is shut off? Is this from the patient or from the cardiologist? Just, just come again, how will you know the, the rhythm? Yes, how will you know the rhythm when the pacemaker is shut off? Is this from the patient or from the cardiologist? Okay, so if the patient, you, you are the first person in contact with the patient and you have no access to a cardiologist, the recommendation is you have to do a 12 lead ECG. Or if you're not able to do a 12 lead ECG, then connect them to a cardiac monitor and activate the pacing mode on the cardiac monitor on. So it will tell you if the device is working or not. Because if the device is working, then you should be able to see those pacing spikes. That's number one. Then the second thing is if they are, the pacing spikes are before every beat, as in for, before every beat there's a pacing spike, then it means that patient is pacemaker dependent, okay? So that is in the case where you are the one evaluating the patient. But if you send the patient to the cardiologist, the first thing they always do is, one, uh, if they have access to the programmer, which they always do, uh, but depending on the company, then they're able to, to, to connect the programmer to the device and it's able, you know, it, it, it automatically generates an ECG because that programmer, you know, gives you an ECG reading of the heart immediately. And, and then it gives you all those figures if it is spacing and capturing and all that. Yeah. So basically you need to confirm on the ECG or on the cardiac monitor whether there is capturing of the pacing or not. Dr. Guerra, your hand is raised. Dr. Guerra, you can unmute yourself. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Adembesa, for your talk. Now, there's something I noted when I asked this question. You said you need to find out when the pacemaker is switched off, whether it goes to assist or later. I think that's what you had uh, mentioned in your talk. Hello, Dr. Adembesa. Yes, I can hear you, Dr. Guaro. So, yes, um, if you mentioned about that. So, how would you know that? That's the part I was asking. So, so, how would so, you so know? That one is usually, yes. So, so that yes, one is usually done. Yeah, that one is usually done by the 
by the programmer. So when when the patient goes to the cardiology clinic um, and they are connected on the programmer, using the programmer, you are actually they are actually able to switch it off, and there you can tell whether the patient you know, uh, has a rhythm or has a complete heart block or not. So for that one, you can only know if you connect the patient on a programmer. So is it some, is this information, is it information they should give you after they've done that? Because most yes. of the patients have anesthetized who have pacemakers. You just told the pacemaker is fine, you can go ahead. So should you prod yes. them and tell yes, them, yes. please tell so, me whether it will go to asystole you know, this is, exactly. uh, we're not used to this. So is it something you should tell them? Tell me whether yes. the patient will go into a systole, give me more details. Cause most cardiologists will just tell you, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. So that is the information they need to give. Um, they, they need to tell you one, whether the device is working properly. Two is in the event that the device goes off, what, what should I expect? Okay. And then three is the patient pacemaker basically dependent. Because most of the time, if a patient is able to go into a seat or you know, there's no rhythm at all or severe brady, then that is a patient who is likely to go into a systole if the device um, is not working. So they need to give you all that information. But I totally agree with you, Dr. Guaro. It's the same thing even when you send for, for patients for cardiology review for other issues. They'll just tell you, patient fit for anesthesia, but they'll not give you the nitty gritties. Like what, what do you mean like patient is fit for anesthesia? Yeah. So that's the information they should give. Okay, thank you for that question. The next question is from Dr. Olang. And this question is, is the ultrasonically activated scapel such as harmonic safe to use in the patients with uh, IECDs? So any any electronic device that generates electronic uh, precaution, but for ultrasound we know. Oh, sorry, sorry, it's ultrasonically activated. Yes, so ultrasound no, yeah, because ultrasound we you know uses different technology from electrical impulses. Yeah, so there's no electromagnetic. Um, interference from that, yeah. Next question is by Brenda Miogo, and her question is, uh, the time lapse between the activation of defibrillator and elective surgery, and what about post-op, or is it uh, on a case-by-case -case basis? Yeah, so uh, ideally, if the defibrillator has to be deactivated, then it should be as close as possible to the surgical time uh, 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 as possible. And in that case, if it has to be done earlier than usual, then those are patients you need to admit in high care unit on continuous monitoring um, and with a defib uh, close by, so that just in case they get a VT or, or, or VF, they're able to, to be defibrillated. And then immediately after surgery, in the immediate post-op period, as soon as the surgery is over, they need to be reprogrammed back. Any further questions? Anyone else with a question? You can either post in the chat box or you can raise your hand and then you mute yourself and ask the question. Okay, I think um, there are no other questions on the chat box. I think we are done with the presentation for now. I'd like uh, to thank Dr. Ari for that presentation. There are a few announcements. Number one is uh, we have a new administrator, uh, Pauline Mutiso. So she started uh, her role last week on Monday. So Pauline, maybe you could uh, unmute yourself and greet the members. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you're all well. I'm happy to join you and I hope I'll serve you to my best. What a picture. But I to put physically. 
Thank you very much, Pauline Karibu. The next announcement is regarding the conference. I want to remind you about our conference in August. The early bird registration is still valid until 31st of April. And also a reminder that this is going to be a physical conference and not hybrid. The CPD points for the earlier, uh, the, the presentation we had last week, and this one is going to be shared in due course. And also KSA would like to urge members to, uh, to renew your annual membership um, to allow the association to keep um, administering its, its duties. Then I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Dembesa for that presentation. I'd like to thank all the members for attending and making this a uh, interactive presentation. Um, without further, there, there being no other business, I'd like to draw this meeting to a, cl a close and people can leave at their own convenience. Thank you very much.